But we're going to carry on in the book of Philippians this morning. And I want to encourage you to turn to chapter 3 if you have your Bibles with you. Before we get into the actual text, I want to take a couple of moments and talk about citizenship. Um, Maybe a little bit about immigration, even. I want to talk about the journey of moving from one country to another. I don't know how many of you have one of these, a Canadian passport. Um, Mine was super easy to get because I was born here in Canada. Uh, All I had to do was fill out a little bit of paperwork. I had to talk about where I was born. And uh, the, the fact that I had a Canadian birth certificate made it very easy for me to get a Canadian passport. How many of you are born and raised in Canada? You've, you've lived here. That is the bulk of us sitting in the room this morning. I've lived here my entire life. My mom was born in the town that I grew up in. I'm not really that intimately acquainted with life as an immigrant. I know that my family came from Britain, but that was generations ago. I have roots from the other side that go back into Iceland. But again, Generations ago, we landed in Canada. None of my blood relatives have been born abroad. Now, I have friends. My my brother Derek, his brother-in-law, Adrian, is from Mexico. And so I've got to experience a guy who's close to my age, what it's like for him to come to Canada to, to marry someone from here and the challenges that go with how do you, you know, find work and how do you do things coming here into Canada. When we were pastoring in... Uh, the upper room in Osborne Village, we had a couple that would come by for the meal afterwards. And they were from Iraq. They were a Muslim couple who, who wanted to come and just sit and talk to some people who would speak English with them. And so they would come. They would bring a little bit to share with the meal. And we would sit down at the table. And they had been here for two years already and knew a little bit of English but had hardly anybody to talk to that understood um, their journey. They came here for their daughters to go to school. They were musicians. They were uh, in a choir together. And so sitting down with my in-laws with power and praise was just like, I'm just going to put you four together and let you chat away. And speaking of my in-laws, that's the closest relative I have who's immigrated to Canada. My father-in-law, Jim, who many of you will have met, they're not here this morning, but Jim came here from Scotland, and you might not be able to tell that because you can't really hear his accent anymore, but if you are standing anywhere near him when he picks up the phone to talk to somebody from his family, it's like a totally different guy. I'm like, what is he talking about? He was 14 years old when his, his family came over here. He was born and raised in Aberdeen, and uh, he... The language may not have been a huge challenge for them because they spoke English, but they had quite the accent. I am fairly certain my father-in-law got made fun of for the first little while, which is maybe why he doesn't have the accent so thick anymore. I'm sure there were challenges that they faced as they began life in the new country. I know Granny wished she had never come. She longed to go back to Scotland. She so badly wanted to just return home. It was challenging for her to bring with her husband and her kids to come here to Canada. My father-in-law didn't become a citizen of Canada until a month ago. Sixty years he lived in Canada with a British passport. And then his true Scotsman came out when he went to re- uh, renew his passport, saw how much it cost to continue to have a British passport and decided, I'm not paying that. I'm going to become a Canadian citizen because our passports are cheaper. <laughs> so my father-in-law was sworn in at the beginning of February uh, as a Canadian citizen at 72 years of age, 73 years of age now. For many, the journey to Canadian citizenship is a difficult one. Many are fleeing persecution, war in their countries of origin. Many are seeking refuge and safety here in Canada. They cross many barriers. They cross many borders. Things like language and culture, even religion, make it very difficult for them to find a place here in Canada. To fit in, it, I can only imagine, would be a very surreal experience. Because I can only imagine what it would be like for me as a white, English-speaking kid, or 40-year-old almost, to move to a country like Iraq and figure out the language and figure out the religion and figure out the culture. I would feel very out of place. I would feel very alone. I imagine that for 
people who have immigrated here to Canada, that living here is a very different experience for them as that, rather than what it is for me, who's grown up, born and raised here. Now, many of you would call this nation home. Many of you raised your hands when I asked how many of you were born and raised here in Canada. But this morning, I want to propose to you that you are actually an immigrant to this land. Not just because your family immigrated years ago from England or Germany or Iceland, but because your citizenship is not solely here in Canada. This morning, I would propose that we have forgotten a little about our homeland. We've maybe gotten a little too comfy and begun to think that this is really all there is to it, that this is our home. Let me get into Philippians to explain. Philippians chapter 3. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destination is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Philippians three, seventeen to the beginning of chapter 4. God, would you allow your word to speak to our hearts this morning? I pray for each one of us to be open to what your spirit would want to say to us. Protect me from saying anything that would be not what you want me to say, but allow me to share everything that your spirit would have for us this morning, we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our citizenship is in heaven is, is the main truth that I draw out of Paul's words here. I love the way that he begins his passage by saying, like, follow my example. That's a pretty gutsy thing for a pastor to ask his people to do. Many of us as pastors would say, do as I say, maybe not always as I do. There are times where I feel very comfortable inviting you to follow along in the footsteps that I am walking in because I believe that I'm walking in the footsteps of Jesus. But I'm a human being. I am just a man who is trying to figure out what this loving Jesus and loving others looks like. So there are times where I fall short and where I mess up just like you do. So for Paul to start off this little section by saying, as you've imitated me, continue following that example and look for others who walk in the same way. Keep a close eye on those who live as we do. And he's talking about the, the Judaizers that we talked about a couple weeks ago where there's other people who are trying to t- teach a different way of living in the church that you have to add a bunch of stuff to your faith. He's saying, don't worry about that stuff. Look at the example that we gave for you. Look at the people who are living in the way of Jesus and follow after them. Don't get caught up with some of that other stuff. And then he goes on to give these words about Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. We're going to get to that in a second. But I love this part where he says, our citizenship is in heaven. This is the main truth that I hope you take home from this morning. This world is not our home. We are visitors here. And that perspective should not only influence the choices that we make, but how we relate to others in this world. Because it's an interesting perspective to look at the world in that way. That if we see ourselves as immigrants here or just visitors journeying to the place of our true citizenship. Now I want to confess to you this morning that this is not the first thought that pops into my mind when the alarm goes off in the morning. It's not the first thing that I wake up to and I'm like, I'm on my way to heaven. Glory is coming. In those moments, when it's still dark outside, I still feel very much a part of this earth. I am reminded of my humanity as my bones crack as I get out of bed and feel the cold hardwood under my feet. The first thing that comes to my mind is shower. Need to shower coffee, need coffee, and need to get into the office. And then the laundry list starts going in my mind. What's on for the day? I try not to run right to the phone and check the emails and the text messages. I try to at least pause for that for a couple of moments. And if I'm not careful, 
If I don't take a moment to curb all of that stuff, to pause and to pray, to invite God to arrest my heart and use me in any way that he sees fit, I won't think about heaven until I get into the office and the coffee is brewing. You see, this is not my natural bent to think about heaven. I imagine that as I get a little bit older, that might become more a part of my journey. But it's also because I don't see as much evidence of heaven in the earth around me. So years ago, it seemed that the church lived with a sense of urgency that I don't readily see in our day. If we go way back to the beginning of the church, when Jesus ascended into heaven and he promised his disciples, he says, go and wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come and I will return for you. There were Christians who believed that Jesus would return to them before they died. That he was going up to heaven, he was preparing a place for them, can't take that long, he's God, he's going to be back down in a couple of weeks. Maybe months. So they worked to spread the message of the gospel. Many of them left their jobs. They quit fishing, they quit tent making, and they decided, okay, if Jesus is coming back, we need to get people ready. There was this urgency about getting the gospel out. People sold their possessions because they believed the time was near. Even if you look at the way the Apostle Paul wrote, if you look at his earlier writings, he said things like, it's better for you not to marry. Don't be distracted. Like the The kingdom is coming. Let's get this message out. And then if you read a little bit later on in his writings, 30, 40 years later, he's like, well, if you do get married, this is how you live well together. There was this sense of urgency and of of getting the good news out. People get ready. Jesus is coming. Soon we'll be going home. I imagine that waned a little as the years rolled on. Even as Paul's writing continue to morph. If you fast forward a few thousand years, the beginning of the last century, the birth of the Pentecostal church in North America, some of you will be familiar with the story of Azusa Street um, down in the States where the the Holy Spirit was being poured out in a fresh way. People were starting to experience uh, revival. There was, people were being saved. People were being healed. There was this sense that God was pouring out his spirit in a new way. People were speaking in tongues. This was, you know, something that had happened in the early church, but we weren't seeing it in the same way that we were starting to see it down in Azusa Street. And there were many people at the, at the turn of that century, right in the late 1800s, early 1900s, who believed that this was a further fulfillment of Joel 2. Uh, let me read the passage for you. This is what was read over and over again in those first few meetings. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. And then here's where it gets to talking a little bit about the end of days. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. From on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance. As the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Spirit was being poured out and women were preaching, people were having dreams, people were prophesying. It must mean that Jesus is coming soon. And there was this huge missional movement that started. Our denomination was founded on missions. I am grateful that this is a church that believes in missions. But when that outpouring happened, there was this sense that Jesus is coming back. We need to get ready. So people started selling all of their things. People started moving to foreign lands to share the good news of Jesus. People started talking to their neighbors about what was going on at Azusa Street. It was the poor who were leading the revival. People started to forsake the things of this earth. They started to look at the things that were in their lives that would maybe be a detriment. And so they started downsizing. Some of them even started forsaking, shunning everything of the world. We got really into the holiness movement and we were trying to get ourselves prepared, get the bride ready. 
I remember reading a story uh, about uh, a church shortly after Azusa Street had broken out who were, were, when bankers would walk into the church in their nicely pressed suits, that the ushers or the people at the front would cut their ties off because the ties were a sign of pride and of the worldly advancement that they were wanting to make. I maybe would fit all okay in Azusa Street, but... <laughs> But there was this sense that these things that would hold us to earth, our money, our power, our desire for more, were deterring us from our true citizenship. And with this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, people were getting this churning that Jesus is coming back. Well, fast forward another hundred years, the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada has now been around for longer than I've been alive. And Jesus still hasn't come back. And maybe our concern with the imminent return of Jesus has waned a little bit. Today, many of us are caught up in saving for our retirement or upgrading our houses or changing diapers or clicking away on Pinterest. The thought of Christ's imminent return doesn't often enter our minds, but that doesn't make it any less true. Christ is coming back. I don't know when, but I know that he is. One of my profs in Bible college had a t-shirt that I wanted to borrow for him for an extended period of time. Um, (laughs) He had a t-shirt that said 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. And I thought, man, if if we could be just even a little bit more preoccupied with the return of Christ, maybe not to the point where we would make 2015 reasons why he's coming back this year. I don't think that would all fit on a t-shirt. But Christ is coming back. I don't know the day or the hour, and the scripture says that none of us do, but that we're meant to keep watch. Paul, in this passage, says, we eagerly await a Savior who will come from heaven. I don't know how eagerly I'm always waiting. I, will, I long for him to come back. But I also long for my next door neighbor to be ready when he comes. See, because he's coming for a bride. He's coming for the church. He's coming for those who know and trust and love him. And those who do will experience the kingdom in all its fullness. They will experience life as it was meant to be. But as this passage remind us, reminds us, there are those who will not. I want to go back and take a look at the first part of this verse for a bit. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. What's Paul getting at with this description? There's some people who would say that he's still talking about those Judaizers, those people who are trying to add things to the faith of the disciples in Philippi, saying like, yes, you're Christians, but you also need to follow the laws of Moses. You need to follow the teaching of the rabbis. You need to be circumcised. It's possible that Paul was again trying to root out this false teaching, but if you look at some of the words that he used to describe them, it seems like he's going a little bit farther than just people who are trying to bring in some false teaching. These words don't seem to line up with people who claim to follow Jesus. Enemies of the cross of Christ, wholly focused on themselves and the things that are here and now, mindset on earthly things. It seems that Paul is talking about worldly, gluttonous, lustful people. I don't know how many of you are familiar with a group known as the Gnostics. Uh, Not agnostics, but just the Gnostics. These were people who tried to intellectualize the Christian faith. uh, Most of them were uh, from a Greek background. They wanted to be able to reason and sort out exactly what this whole faith thing was about. And so they decided that they would distill all of this teaching of Jesus down into a, just a very simple philosophy. And that simple philosophy boils down to this. They saw the world as split into two realities. There was spirit and there was matter. Now matter, or the things that we can touch and feel, was altogether evil. But spirit was altogether good. So man, his body, is altogether evil, but the spirit that lives inside of him is altogether good. And Jesus came to redeem our spirit, would be their understanding. 
But the outflow of that particular philosophy was that if our bodies are essentially evil, it doesn't matter what you do with or to your body because it can never be redeemed. It is essentially evil. Only our sinfulness affects the body. It doesn't affect our spirit, is what the Gnostics believed. And so there was a group of people who, who had this form of Christianity, this belief that Jesus maybe was who he said he was, but the way that it played out in their lives looked very different from the example that Paul had set for the believers. Their philosophy had no bearing on their spirit, only on their bodies, so they decided that they could just revel in all kinds of debauchery. It's possible that that's who Paul is talking about here because they were very prevalent in the church at this time. But it could also be that Paul's just talking about every single person who doesn't know Christ. It's possible that he's referring to all of those people who have not yet experienced the grace, the mercy, the redemption of God. To those who have not yet come to realize that Jesus did die for them, And that in the cross they can find their redemption and salvation. And so rather than accepting that, they live as enemies. They reject that cross. He says their destiny is destruction. I think this phrase holds true both here and now and in eternity. If we live only for ourselves, chasing after our own appetites and desires, that leads to destruction. People who live selfishly, who care only about fulfilling their own appetites, do not function well in society. These are people who ultimately use others for their own gratification, leading to all forms of debauchery and wickedness. We have laws to protect us from people who choose to live this way. And their lives here now end up in ruin. But there's so much more than just getting into a mess here on earth. Because ultimately, leading a life that cares only about ourselves, that only looks after our own wants and desires, will lead us to destruction. It will lead us to a place where we will spend eternity outside of the presence of God. The Bible describes this place as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Their destiny is destruction. Those who live as enemies of the cross will spend eternity separated from the one who died on that cross to save them but it's because they choose to follow their own desires rather than surrender to Jesus because their God is their stomach. Now, this is not a reference to gluttony. Uh, This is not, though I do sometimes feel guilty when I go to Gasthaus Gutenberg and I have to be like rolled out the door. This is talking about having appetites that are insatiable where we lust after things that will never satisfy, where we want to just fill ourselves, fill our bellies with the things of this world, things like fame and power and wealth and beauty and sex. When we are left to our own desires, when we chase after those things unbridled, they rule over us and our appetites never seem filled. Our God becomes our stomach, our own desires. We're ruled by nothing except our own whims. Now, the Gnostics believed that man actually could not be considered whole or have not experienced all there was of life. They weren't complete until they experienced everything that the world had to offer. So that means they would plunge the depths of their sinful behavior in hopes of being made whole. Their God became their stomach. There was no such thing as lust or gluttony or drunkenness for them because their glory was in their shame. They reveled in debauchery. They flaunted their sin. The body was sinful and had no effect on the spirit, so why try to change that sinful part of us? If your spirit remains good and untouched by sinful matter, they would boast about their sin. They would debase themselves over and over again. As I read this description, and as I think about these sort of things, I see so much of this in our own society today, where we chase after the things that make us happy. Happiness is a huge word. I just thought of this right now, that the like, number one song last year, Because I'm Happy. 
Clap along if you... Oh, yeah, Luke's got it. He's grooving back there. <laughs> that is an anthem for people right now. Well, it, it doesn't make me happy. Yeah. Is that really the highest goal? Is that you're happy? What if your happiness causes somebody else's pain? Last year, one of the Academy Award-nominated pictures was a movie called The Wolf of Wall Street. Now, I've not seen the movie, so I can't speak too accurately to what it depicts, but I do know these facts about it. It made nearly $400 million at the box office. That is a lot of money. It was nominated for multiple awards, and it has been deemed one of Martin Scorsese's best pictures some things you might also want to know about that movie. It has also become famous for having more than 500 F words in it. So at 170 ti- or 179 running minutes, that's one every 18 seconds. And people flock to it. The plot and content, when I heard about it, realized the movie was not for me. It's about drug abuse, lust, excess, about exploiting people for your own good, about the glory being your shame. Our world maybe isn't all that different nearly 2,000 years after this letter was written. Because Paul's final phrase there is, their mind is set on earthly things. If I could describe our world right now, there is that with a hint of spirituality. People are sometimes willing to talk to Oprah about what's going on with their spirits. (laughs) But for the most part, our minds are set on earthly things. We're caught in the here and now. And sometimes it's really tough to get past that. When bills are mounting, when car accidents happen, when diagnoses of cancer happen, it's hard to get our minds wrapped around eternity. What will happen when I die? Many of us don't think about our own mortality until it's too late. It takes a cancer diagnosis or a close call in a traffic accident to even get some people's minds off of earthly things. We forget that this world is not the final reality. I remember hearing a story of a a young man who uh, had this kind of a beater of a car and he had uh, driven home from, um, from university Uh, to his parents' place for the weekend, and he had surprised his parents with a visit. And he had pulled up, his parents had just renovated their house, and his dad had just put down a brand new pavement on the front driveway. And so he pulled his beater of a car up onto the driveway, parked it, and ran inside. His parents were so excited, welcomed him home. Next morning, the son had to take off back to college. He pulled out, and there was a huge oil patch left right in the middle of Dad's new driveway. And Dad was furious. He phoned up his son, and he tore a strip off of him. How dare you? Don't, why didn't you think to park on the street? How would you park that piece of junk on my new driveway? So he hung up in anger with his son. The phone call rang. About an hour later, and it was the hospital where he had gone in for a checkup earlier in the week. We have bad news. You have cancer. It is terminal. You need to get your house in order. Between those two phone calls, the father recognized that I had my son at home with me for a weekend. And now I may not have many more opportunities to be with him. Sometimes it takes moments like that to rattle us out of our having our minds set on earthly things. We're made for so much more than this, and yet we often find ourselves focused on the things that don't really matter. Now, this is a pretty depressing description of the world that we live in. And that's why I love the way that Paul lays this truth out. He says, as I've told you before, I tell you once again, even with tears. When Paul reads these words out, he's not going like this. Oh, their destiny is destruction. They're going to get what's coming to them. No. Paul says, even with tears. Does that description of the world around you move you to compassion? Does the lostness of other people cause your heart to be moved? Because I think there are three possible ways we can respond to people who live outside of a relationship with Jesus. And the first one, unfortunately, is the way 
we're often perceived as Christians. We can judge. I'm not saying we always do, but it's the way that we're often perceived. We can look at the mess that some people are in and we can say, well, they've made their choices. If they chose a better way, if they chose to surrender to Christ, they wouldn't be in this situation. They're getting what they deserve. Their destiny is destruction because their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. This is what happens. Do those words give you a sense of satisfaction or do they give you a sense of sorrow? Because sometimes we can get a little self-righteous and look down our noses at those who are chasing after the flesh and caught up in the temptations of the world and we, we can get the feeling that we're a little better than they are. We say, well, if you didn't chase after that stuff... If you didn't just give in to your unhealthy desires, you wouldn't be in the mess that you're in. If your God wasn't your stomach, you wouldn't be in this chaos. Unfortunately, we as the church have often related to people outside the family that way. We've chosen to separate ourselves. We've said, well, if they want destruction, let them have it. We should keep our distance. We see ourselves as in and them as out, and maybe there's very little chance for those two groups to meet. So we can judge, but there's another option. We can love. We can suspend our judgment for a moment and hear somebody's story. We can befriend those who are very different than us. Do our best to reveal Jesus to them. Sometimes this gets a little bit dicey, though, because we might have to get a little closer to their muck and mess, and we might get our hands dirty. But what if we were moved to compassion to make our way into the gutter to help somebody out? If we realize that if it wasn't for the grace of God, we could be in the exact same shoes. You see, I'm acutely aware of my own sinfulness. So I have a tough time judging others who sin differently than I do. Because I'm reminded on a regular basis of how I fall. But those people who sin differently than I do, do do they know that grace is available? Do they know that forgiveness is possible? That this is not the only way? Do they know that there is redemption? There is new life? That there is a hope of heaven and it is just one breath away? Does their wickedness arouse my judgment or my compassion? So we could judge. We could separate ourselves. We could love and maybe get ourselves messy. But I think there's a third option we probably find a little more prevalent for us today. Elie Wiesel, who is a brilliant author, he wrote a book I read back in high school called Night. He's a Holocaust survivor, and whether or not this is a logical argument, uh, whether this definition works for everything, I'm not sure, but it's really beautiful. He said the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of love is not hate or judgment, it's indifference. Does the hope of heaven come into my heart very often? What about those people who don't share that same hope? How often do they come into my heart? What is my response? Am I like Paul, even with tears, recognizing that? Somebody might not be ready if Jesus were to return tomorrow. I think our indifference is perhaps the most insidious form of our lack of love. That we get so caught up in our own lives, specifically here, our earthly life, that we forget that this world isn't our home, that we're citizens of heaven, bound for a different land, and our friends and neighbors might not even know it. Have they seen your passport? Do they know that you live by a different set of rules, by different principles? I'm not saying that you need to get a megaphone and stand on their front lawn. But do you talk about what Jesus means to you? Do you talk about why you go to church, why you live the way that you do? We live in a country that is very understanding. You will run into the odd person who will freak out maybe and just tell you that they don't want to hear it. That's fine. There have been so many conversations I've had with people just because I've said, like, well, I was at church the other day. I'm like, you go to church? What's that all about? And on the conversation goes. Have your friends heard your story? Do they know what it meant to you to have Jesus enter into your life? Have they experienced the love of Jesus through you? 
Can I give you my understanding, just really quickly here, about our role in the salvation of another person? I used to feel like it was my job to convince somebody to become a Christian. That I had to get them saved. And so I worked really hard. When I first became a Christian, all of my buddies who I used to go drinking with, I would look for opportunities to, like, get them saved. And I remember one, one time, I was a brand new Christian. Let me <laughs> paraphrase this before I set this out first. I've been a Christian just a couple of months, and... Uh, a friend of mine invited me to go to a party out near Miami, Manitoba, and it was going to be out at somebody's house. And so we're driving along together, and we've got beer, and there's other stuff that's going to be at this party. And we sit down, and we're at the kitchen table, and I'd, I'd been around alcohol quite a bit, drugs not so much, but this party was getting a little bit out of hand. And uh, we're sitting at the table, and people are passing stuff around, and it comes to me, and I just kind of said, no, I'm good, and I pass it along. And my friend who was sitting next to me was like, you're going to get us thrown out of this party. And everybody else is fine. But when we were driving home, he asked me, he said, like, so why, why didn't you? Like, why did you choose not to in that moment indulge? And I just said, like, uh... And I decided in that moment I was going to share my story with my buddy Colin. And I said, like, well, I, I kind of became a Christian a little while ago. And he's like, what? And I was like, yeah, and, like, since I became a Christian, like, there's no, like, better high than knowing that I'm loved by God and experiencing His Holy Spirit. And I was like, I, you could have heard a trombone go, wah, wah, wah. Like, I, I was like, oh, like I totally killed that moment. And so he just kind of let it slide, and we changed the subject for a little while. Fast forward four years later, and my buddy Colin had moved away, and we weren't really in touch anymore. He phoned me up out of the blue, and he says, hey, remember that conversation we had back in the car? And I'm like, uh, like, which one of the thousands? He's like, the one where you talked about the Holy Spirit. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, no, I remember that conversation. <laughs> I think I might have experienced that. I was like, what? I was at church. I think I might have experienced that. Colin is a born again follower of Jesus, has a wife and three kids. You don't always know that the, the seeds that you're going to plant, but it's not your job to save them. That was the worst, the worst way to try and lead somebody to Jesus. Let's go to a party where we're both going to drink, get hammered. There's going to be other stuff going around. I didn't have my act together. But God still used that moment anyway. See, I think we're called to point people to Jesus. I don't think it's our job to convince them. I feel there's probably very few people who are actually ever won to Jesus by a well-crafted argument, because I've got a few of them. I know my ontological argument. I know how to argue for God against the problem of evil. I've got some of those things in my toolbox. Most of my friends aren't interested in that. They don't care my arguments for or against God or belief in Jesus but they have a really tough time understanding the love and grace of Jesus. And when they meet him in person, when they meet him as the third member of the Trinity, grace and love embodied, they can't help but be changed. So it's not your job to save people. It's the Holy Spirit that moves in people's lives. It's him who draws them to Christ. But it is your job to help point them to Jesus. Our job as followers of Jesus is to help people see him more clearly. You can pray. You can plant seeds. You can remove some barriers to faith. My friends Greg and Candace, that's my, my goal for them has always been to just help remove some of those barriers. When they hear Pentecostal pastor, this is the picture they get. I want them to see Jesus more clearly, not Pentecostal pastor. I want them to see Jesus. It's our job to love like him. Back to the citizenship idea. The kingdom of heaven has the most ridiculous immigration policy you could imagine. It is obscene because God says, whosoever will come. Anybody. I'll take anybody and everybody. Sometimes we put barriers. Sometimes we say, no, if you're like this, if you're like this, if you're not willing to do this, then nope, you can't come in. Not God. God is calling everyone. He loves everyone. 
all who are worn, all who are wayward and torn, you are welcome here. God is calling your family members who don't know Jesus. He is calling your next door neighbor. And you may not recognize what his spirit is at work doing while you're out and about doing your regular stuff. See, I wholeheartedly believe that we live in the Father's world. Our Father, the creator of the universe, is at work in the lives of individuals in ways that we're not aware of. You might not be aware of how the Spirit has already planted other seeds that you're adding water to. You might not be aware that the Holy Spirit has been tugging on people's hearts, people who seem very far from Jesus at this moment. You don't know what the Spirit is at work doing in their lives. Because I believe, without a shadow of a doubt, that the God who loves this world so much is constantly speaking to people. The passage in Philippians serves as a reminder to us that this world isn't our home. This is not the end of the story. We are pilgrims. We are immigrants in this land. The diaper changing, the retirement saving, this is not our ultimate reality. There has to be more than this. And your neighbors and your friends may not experience it every single day, but they do have moments. There are glimmers. There are, as T.S. Eliot says, there are tremors of bliss. There are winks of heaven in this world. A little nod to the eternal. All the chasing after our own desires, it doesn't satisfy us. If we're left to our own devices, those words that Paul penned are absolutely true. Our stomachs, our appetites, our desires, they become our gods, and they will only lead us to destruction. But we were created for more. If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. C.S. Lewis. So this morning, you may be sitting here and feeling like those words sometimes describe you. That you're caught up in the things of this earth, that you've maybe given very little thought to what eternity would hold. Maybe you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. You've never embraced his work on the cross and asked for forgiveness. Or maybe it's something that you did years ago. But this morning you find yourself worshiping other gods, chasing after the things of this world, and you're not satisfied. Hear these words this morning. You were created for so much more. You were created for relationship with God and Jesus has made it possible for us to have our sins forgiven and for us to be brought back into the family. We simply need to confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead and scripture says we will be saved. If we surrender our lives to him, that on that day when he returns, whether it's in our lifetime or in the future, We'll return to our country of origin, the place we were made for. Our citizenship is in heaven. So I ask you, do you have your passport? Do you know that if he came back today, you would be ready? You might be sitting here as a follower of Jesus and realize that heaven's not really been on your mind that much. And neither have your neighbors who would miss the boat if Jesus came back today. I want you to think about your citizenship this morning because this world is not your home. So if you're here and you've never thought about a relationship with Jesus, I would love to spend some time after the service just chatting with you. You can pray even where you're sitting right now. You can ask God to forgive you at any time in your life, anywhere. But I'd love to help answer some of those questions you might have about what starting that journey would look like. But if you've known Jesus for a while already, Would you take some time this week to think about your citizenship, to be reminded that this world is not our home, that we should be eagerly awaiting our Savior? And then think about the way that we relate to those who at this moment may be living, as Paul says, as enemies of the cross of Christ. How do you respond to them? Do you judge? Do you love? Are you indifferent? How do we point others to Jesus so that they too could know and love him the way that we know and love him? How could we more accurately reveal his goodness to a world that has their mind caught on earthly things? Let's pray. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back. I'd like to close with a song after we pray.
Sometimes I think your plan is a little too simple, God. I think about... I think about the cross and I understand that that's uh, a a massive undertaking to take the entire sin of the world and place it on your son. But our response to that cross seems too easy. Sometimes I feel like we should have to jump through a few more hoops or we should have to beat ourselves up a little bit more. But the truth is, if any one of us would call on the name of the Lord we would be saved. If we would accept that work of Christ on that cross, if we would believe that his suffering and death paid the price for all of our sin, we would be saved. I pray, God, if there is anyone in this room this morning that finds that to be their reality, their truth, that they they have not surrendered their lives to you. They have not accepted you as their Lord and their Savior. They have not begun this journey of walking with God. I pray that today would be a brand new day for them. That they would, in the quietness of this moment, say, Jesus, I don't fully understand what's going on right now. But I believe that you can forgive me. And I ask you to. Would you wash me clean? Would I be as white as snow today? I want to give you my life. Thank you, Lord, that we're never too young or too old to make that decision. And sometimes we might need to make it more than once in our life that today could be a fresh start for each one of us. For those of us who have friends and neighbors who would find that being their reality. That they don't yet know or love you. Pray that you'd help us. Help us to reveal your love and grace in a way that helps them to see you more clearly. Help us to speak hope and life into situations where there isn't a lot of that. Where our friends and our families and our co-workers and neighbors have been so caught up in the things of this earth. Help us to just peel back the curtain a little bit and let people see that this, this is not the end of the story. That this world is not really our home. That there is so much more beyond what we're experiencing. And that we want to be preparing for that journey. Death is not going to be the end. It is going to be the beginning. It is going to be the stepping through the veil into what the ultimate reality is. It is God. It is His holiness and His righteousness and our worship of Him. So would you help us? Help us to have heaven on our hearts. Help us to have Jesus on our lips. Help us to live out this gospel for those who need it so desperately. We ask these mercies in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing uh, that last song that we sang, Come As You Are. I'm just going to encourage you if, you, if you prayed today that to invite Jesus into your heart for kind of the first time, I just encourage you to stick around for a little bit after the service. I'd love to talk with you. For those of you who would just want the Spirit to move in your life in such a way that heaven is on your heart, would this be your prayer? sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted let rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come near earth has 
no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your face in this earth that heaven is not going to redeem or make up for. And so help us to live in the light of eternity. Help us to be people who experience a little bit of the kingdom here, but look forward to the kingdom in its fullness when we see you face to face. Help us to be ready, Lord, and help us to eagerly await through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Amen. So for those of you who would want to stick around, talk a little bit about what it means to follow Jesus, I'd love to do that. For those of you who want to sit and discuss this message a little bit more, there's tables at the back with some questions to ponder. What's my attitude towards those who don't yet know Jesus? What three people could I pray specifically for this week? And how can I live a little more aware of the reality of heaven? What are our thoughts to ponder for the week? Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.